Uh, the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew for Beginners. This is lesson number six, entitled Names and Mission of the Apostles. And uh, we're going to be looking at discourse number two. And that would be in chapter 10, verses one to 42. Boy, if you haven't been in this class, all that <laughs> encyclopedic information onto uh, you know, where, we're at in our, uh, where we're at in our course, it helps to understand that Matthew, the book of Matthew, divided into a series of six narratives and five discourses. Narrative, discourse, narrative, discourse, narrative, discourse. That's how the book is divided. Made it easy to study, memorize, a uh, good way to, uh, to teach as well. So there's a description of certain activity that's taking place. Those are the narratives. Those are followed by a section of direct teaching, what we call the discourses. Last week we looked at the uh, second narrative as, a, as Matthew describes you know, a series of Jesus' miracles and the responses to people who were questioning Him. And at the end of this section uh, there were a few verses showing Jesus praying for people to respond to His call for discipleship in order to go out and reap the harvest of souls. So he's not at the end, he's not just you know, asking for people to respond to his message of the kingdom is coming, you know, enter into the kingdom. He's actually asking for people to help him you know, gather the harvest of people that are waiting for the, uh, for the kingdom. So in that section, chapter nine, verses 35 to 38, it served as a kind of a bridge, if you wish, to the next discourse where Jesus is going to select and instruct His disciples in the role of apostleship or messengers to the lost sheep of Israel. So in 39, 35, 38, you know, pray to the Lord of harvests you know, that He sends out workers. You know, the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. And now when we move into chapter 10, we're going to see Him select certain workers and prepare them to go out. So let's go to chapter 10. I don't usually read a lot of the passages. I ask you to do that ahead of time, but just to set this up, let's read chapter 10, verse one. And it says, Jesus summoned His 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. So now Matthew assumes the readers already know the 12 special disciples of Jesus. I mean, you know, we know that he had many disciples, actually sent out more than 12 on one occasion, sent out 70 uh, on uh, one occasion, uh, also sent them out with power. So there's a difference here between those 70 that he sent out and here in Matthew 10 talking about the 10. Uh, here it says Jesus gives them authority and that term denotes both power and the right to use the power. A little bit like uh, you know, the president uh, in, uh, in you know, uh, politics today you know, is asking Congress for the right to use the power to go fight a certain war. Well, the same idea to give authority means to give them the ability to exercise the power and the right to do it. Also. Uh, this demonstrates Jesus' deity. If somebody says, where does it say that Jesus you know, is, is God? Where does it actually say that He's divine? You know? Well, you could go to Matthew chapter 10, verse one, and explain that someone who actually does miracles, all right, is doing so by the power of, of divinity. You, know, you can't do miracles if you're just an ordinary human being. We don't have that power, but God gives the power to somebody to do miracles. Well, that's one thing. But if you are giving the power to do miracles to another person, that denotes divinity. No one else is able to do that except God. Uh, he also says that power is over the spiritual realm, the ability to cast out demons, as well as the physical realm. In other words, Jesus is giving them authority over the spiritual realm, as well as the physical realm, in healing diseases and sicknesses and so on and so forth. Now we move on in chapter 10. Uh, Jesus gives the name of the uh, disciples. Um, he calls them apostles. Apostles means more, means more than just a servant sent to deliver a message, because the word in general means a messenger, but here in this case 
It denotes a fully empowered representative or legate who acts for a lord or king, like an ambassador, right? We send, the United States will send an ambassador somewhere. Well, that person is speaking on behalf of the president, on behalf of the nation, has power. Same idea here, okay? Sometimes this word, apostle, is used to refer to those who helped the apostles, like Barnabas in the book of Acts, refer to him sometimes as an apostle. Uh, but when that word is you know, used in referring to the 12 or the 12 apostles, the Bible speaks of these special, special uh, messengers. So uh, what I'm trying to get at here in a long-winded way is that the word apostle all by itself can refer to somebody who's delivering a message. Okay? But when it refers to the 12, it means something special. They were more than just messengers. They had a very special message and they were empowered in a special way. For example, uh, they were the eyewitnesses and um, those who eyewitnessed the life and the death, the resurrection of Jesus. Not all the messengers had had that experience, that they were there from the beginning when he was when Jesus was baptized, witnessed that, witnessed His life, His miracles, and so on and so forth, witnessed His death, witnessed His resurrection. So when we're talking about the apostles, we're talking about the men that witnessed all those things. Secondly, we're talking about the ones to whom the responsibility was given to establish the church. Again, a lot of, you know, a lot of apostles, a lot of messengers out there, but the 12, they were the ones that established the church. They had the authority to appoint elders. You know, in our Sunday class, talking about elders and deacons, it was those apostles that had the power to do these things. And also they were the ones through whom Jesus' instructions and teachings were not only conveyed to the people at the time, but were also recorded and confirmed for future generations. So they were messengers, but they were special messengers, empowered in a special way, having a very special experience, had been given a very special ministry. There were 14 apostles in all. Uh, Judas, one of the 12, was replaced by Matthias. And of course, Paul was called as an apostle to the Gentiles. Uh, there will never be any other apostles. I know that in some uh, denominations, you know, there, there are some people who call themselves you know, Apostle Joe or Apostle Bill, you know, and they can call themselves that, maybe they're messengers. You know. But there'll never be any apostles like these apostles here. Interesting the way they're grouped. The list uh, are usually grouped in pairs. Peter, whenever the, the, the apostles are listed, Peter's always first, Judas is always last. Uh, in uh, Matthew, uh, sometimes given uh, Peter's Jewish name, Simon is used at times. Uh, Andrew, Peter's brother, is listed along with him. Then you have James and John, another set of brothers. Then Philip and Bartholomew, sometimes referred to as Nathaniel. You kind of get confused sometimes. So Bartholomew, Nathaniel, this is the same guy, same person. Uh, Thomas, Doubting Thomas, we know him from that. Matthew, the publican. Matthew, the one who's writing this particular gospel. Um, there's another James here, second James. And Thaddeus, and Thaddeus even is even more confusing because sometimes he's uh, referred to as Lebe Lebeus or Judas, because Judas was a very common name at the time. Okay? So in different places they, they refer to Thaddeus by other names. So if you see two, a list and there's Judas and Judas, well one of the Judas is the traitor, the other Judas is the apostle who has another name, Lebeus uh, or Thaddeus. And then there's a second Simon. You know, there's Simon Peter, okay? and then there's another Simon. Uh, he was from Canaan. He was from the land of Canaan. Peter was from Galilee. Uh, the second Simon was a zealot. He was a member of a sect, zealot. They were insurrectionists, basically. They were trying to overthrow Roman domination and so on and so forth. And then, of course, Judas is mentioned last. Judas Iscariot means the man from Kerioth. 
Kerioth was his hometown, small village in Judea, so that's why he's called Judas, should be Judas from Kerioth. And he was designated the traitor, and I've already mentioned Matthias and uh, Paul later on. Some names are found in other lists with some kind of changed around, but as I said, Peter's always mentioned first, Judas is always mentioned last. Now, uh, Jesus gives them in Matthew 10 instructions concerning their mission. I'm not going to read that long passage. Uh, but in these instructions are contained the information pertaining to their immediate mission in Galilee, but also a wider view of their mission to all the world as to how their message would be received and how their own, how their own reaction uh, should be played out and how the people would react to their reaction. So Jesus not only telling them, here's what you're going to do, but He also tells them, and here's how people are going to react to what you're going to say, and this is how you're going to react to how they react. You know? So He's kind of laying it all out for them so they won't, be, they won't be surprised. So the first task is their ministry to Israel. So Jesus begins by giving them instructions concerning their immediate work while He is still there. So here's what they had to do. First, <coughs> They had to go only to the Jews, not the Gentiles, not the Samaritans, only the Jews. Verses five and six, we read about that. The gospel and the kingdom was supposed to be first established among the Jews and then spread to all parts of the world. Acts chapter one, verse eight, and then Romans chapter one, verse 16. And someone will say, well, why? Why is it like that? Why not go to all the world right away? Well, it's like that because that was the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. In the Old Testament, the prophets said that the Messiah would come first to the Jews. It was, uh, it was the blessing. It was the reward. You people have carried the promise. You've borne the burden of bringing the Messiah <laughs> into the world for generations, for centuries. Your reward? You get the first, you know, he goes to you first, he's yours. It was a reward, he's going, he was going to be one of them. So that's why their first task is to go first to the Jews. Secondly, preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, what are we going to say, Lord? What's the sermon? Well, the sermon is, get ready, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This was to be the theme of their proclamation. And the idea was that the rule of grace, the power and the promises of God that were made to them in the Old Testament were about to be fulfilled. And what were they doing? They were merely continuing the preaching of John the Baptist. This is exactly what John the Baptist was preaching. So Jesus said, you know what John the Baptist was preaching? Well, you guys, this is what you're going to preach. You keep preaching. Keep preaching that message. Again, why? Why keep preaching that message? Well, Jesus hadn't died yet. They couldn't preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus because it hadn't happened yet. So they were preaching, get ready, it's coming, it's here, it's upon us. Number three, He empowered them to perform miracles. In verse eight, healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons. They received this ability for free, and they were to use this for the benefit of the people for free. Again, why? Why did He give them this power? Well, they're going around and saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, you need to get ready, so on and so forth, and uh, the people were saying, well, yeah, why should we believe you? We've got teachers, we have Pharisees, we have scribes, we've got prophets, we've got all kinds of people teaching us, why should we believe you? Well, wait a minute, you, you have leprosy? Okay, boom, you don't have leprosy anymore. You, you're blind? Okay, now you can see. So the miracles, you know, the ability to do miracles were given to them in order to confirm that what they were saying was true and was from God. Uh, what to bring and what not to bring. Verses 9, 10, they were to bring no money, no luggage, no extra clothing, no shoes. This is why women were not chosen to be missionaries. Nah, I'm just kidding, that's just a joke. It's just, they were to bring no extra things. I, I, I needed to kind of raise up some of our flagging class members there. And so anyways, <laughs> we can edit all this out later. No, we won't, all right. 
<laughs> That's good. Listen, just be happy I'm not giving names, okay? <laughs> So they were to bring nothing with them. And the whole point was they were to go as they were. Uh, Jesus sends them out with the basic physical necessities and what does He do? He assures them that He'll take care of them. I, I, I'll take care of you. I'll prove to you and to all future missionaries, all future individuals that are going to go out, that if they go out in my name, I'll take care of you. All right? Uh, their method of operation, verses 11, 15, they are to preach and to do their work and their mir miraculous work and determine by the response who is willing to accommodate them. And when they're offered a place to stay, they're to stay put until it's time to leave. And, and sometimes you wonder why. Well, because no begging, no going from door to door, no saying, you know, uh, I know you offered me this, but maybe we'll hold off, maybe we can get some better accommodations. Now, the idea was if someone offers you hospitality, accept the hospitality and just stay there. Uh, when they enter, they're to offer a greeting of peace. And if the hosts are receptive of Christ, this blessing will remain upon the home. If not, the apostles leave and uh, the blessing returns back to them. Uh, if, they, uh, uh, if they're not accepted, if this occurs, they're to leave and as a sign that they have been there and been rejected, they're to shake the dust off of that place, off of themselves as a sign of the rejection that they have suffered. They had actually been there, in their homes, brought the gospel, but were rejected. And so the sign of the shaking off of the dust is literally saying, we're shaking off the dust of this place in the same way that God is shaking you off because you have not accepted the message from God. So Jesus reminds them of the judgment reserved for those who reject the message. All right, so then there are some warnings. Warnings as to the response of the people. Remember I said to you, uh, Jesus is saying to them, this is what you're going to say, this is your, you know, your, the way you're going to operate when you go somewhere. Now let me tell you what's going to happen to you when you start doing this work. And let's read that in Matthew 10, verse uh, 16. He says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. But beware of men, for they will hand you over to the courts and scourge you in their synagogues, and you will even be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they hand you over, do not worry about how or what you are to say, for it will be given to you in that hour what you are to say. For it is not you who speak, but it is the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. But whenever they persecute you in one city, flee to the next, for truly I say to you, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. I don't know about you, but if I've just been given my job and instructions and how to do everything and then told this here, this is, this is what's going to happen when I go out, I, you know, I, I maybe be a little hesitant. So here Jesus warns them as to the response that they're going to receive, not only from the Jews, but also the response that they will receive as they bring the gospel beyond Israel after He's gone. So what exactly is going to happen? Well, first of all, He says, people will not take happily to your message. I mean, the true nature of the world, sheep and wolves, and the need to be harmless but wise. They'll be in some cases brought before lower courts, those are Jewish courts, the Sanhedrin, and sometimes higher courts, the governors and the kings. And they'll be brought there because of the gospel and in doing so will cause even the leaders to hear and examine the message of Jesus. But he's saying to them, you know, don't, don't be fooled. The kings and the leaders are not going to come to you asking you to give them the message. You'll give them the message, but usually it's because you're in jail or usually because they may be deciding to you know, execute you. Secondly, he says that Jesus will provide for them in their hour of trial. 
Now he's not promising to protect them against imprisonment or torture or even death, which all of them suffered except John. John's the one that lived a very old age. What he does is he promises to inspire them in their proclamation and defense of the gospel through the Holy Spirit when the time comes. They may be persecuted, but they won't be confused. They may be threatened, but they won't misspeak because of perhaps their fear. Let's face it, if your whole life is focused on delivering this message, the last thing you want to do if you're about to be martyred is to fumble the ball. You know what I'm saying? You don't want to fumble the ball at the last minute and say the wrong thing or back out or you know, become confused or tongue-tied. So I said, don't worry about it. If, 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 if it gets to that point, I'll make sure that you go out in glory. You will deliver the message correctly. Uh, the results of their preaching, he says the gospel will bring division. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it nice if he would have said, boy, if you can just get this message out, everything would be great. You know, what I find interesting is when people who don't believe in God have all these solutions you know, about how everything they, you know, all their solutions to social problems are going to bring all kinds of peace and harmony to society. And they think that's going to do it. When God says, if you bring the true solution from God, it'll cause division. <laughs> so if human solutions, you know what I'm saying? Uh, if human promises uh, uh, can't bring unity, uh, we shouldn't uh, think that uh, what God is bringing is going to fix everything. It's going to create division. That's what Jesus says. Don't, don't be naive. They will be persecuted because of Christ and the message is going to bring uh, all kinds of problems to them. Um, he says um, only those who persevere will be saved. It, 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 it's not the call to apostleship that saves them, but it's faithfulness despite the persecution uh, to the very end that saves them, just as perseverance saves us. You know, I've often used this passage here to remind us that here Jesus is saying, you know, you'll be beaten, you'll be whipped, you'll be imprisoned, you'll be tortured, you know, but if you, if you persevere right to the end, you know, you'll, you'll be saved. Think about what he's just said. You're going to suffer all these things and I'm saying to you, make sure you, you, know, you remain faithful through all of that turmoil, all of that suffering, make sure you hang in there to the end because if you do, you'll be saved. And in our experience many times we see people who quit the church, who abandon everything because somebody said something they didn't like. <laughs> or because they switched the worship time from 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. and they didn't like that. Or one of the elders didn't go to the hospital when they were having their foot surgery or so. Yeah, you know, whatever. They, they got upset and they got mad at the church and they got mad at the preacher or something like that for some insult, some imagined hurt or some even a very real offense. Someone overlooked them or something like that or was unkind to them. And in their minds they think that this justifies their abandonment of their faith. And I I'd like to point them to this passage here. If Jesus is saying to His apostles, look, <laughs> you're going to be beaten and tortured and put in prison, and I'm telling you, you better hang in there till the end. Well, if they had to hang in there to the end through all of that, surely we, you, know, you see what I'm getting at? Surely we have to hang in there too, despite some of the, you know, some of the offenses that we, uh, we have to uh, bear among one another. Uh, and I'll add only one other thing to that is you can't put three, four, five hundred sinners together in one place, ask them to interact with one another and not create some sort of you know, <laughs> conflict from time to time. So you know, when you're tempted to quit or give up you know, because of things like that, remember this passage. 
uh, that others have been asked to bear under a whole lot more suffering than we have. So he prophecies here, by the way, uh, that the destruction of the Jewish nation, which will happen in 70 AD, will occur before they will be able to bring the news to all of the towns. And when he says the Son of Man, when he uses that term, it's a term to point to judgment. In other words, he refers to himself or he refers to the coming of the Son of Man. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean the end of time. It means the coming of the Son of Man is a way to, to say judgment will come. And so throughout history, judgment has come at various times. To Sodom and Gomorrah, judgment came. And to, uh, to the northern kingdom, judgment came. And the Son of Man came to Judea, the southern kingdom, when they fell into idolatry and so on and so forth. So whenever you see that term, know that it's a term of uh, judgment and not necessarily uh, reflecting the end of the world. Okay, instructions on their response to people's reaction to the gospel. Remember he says, you're going to say this, they're going to respond to you back like this, so how should you respond back to them? So let's, uh, let's go to there. People's reactions and how they should react. He says to them, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised if they treat you like they treated me. I mean, let's face it, they accused him of being the devil. He's Jesus, he never did anything wrong, never sinned, <laughs> healed, gave his life, and yet they still accused him of being the devil. So he said, if they accused him of being the devil, imagine what they're going to say of you people, the followers, because we are sinners and we do do we do make mistakes and we do fall short and we don't always give the witness that we'd want to give. So don't be surprised if people will accuse you of being a hypocrite or accuse you of thinking you're holier or better than everybody else or whatever, you know, religious freak or you know, do-gooder. Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised, he said. All right? You can be disappointed and hurt, that's normal, but don't be surprised. Secondly, he says, don't be afraid. Verses 26 to 33. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of failure. You know, everything he says that is secret now will one day be revealed out in the open. Well, what is secret? Well, their schemes and the ways that they try to destroy you, that's secret, that'll come out. And the gospel, which is not known now, it'll come out as well. Don't, don't, don't be afraid. Everything's going to be out in the open one day. And he says, don't be afraid of death. They may kill your bodies, but they can't destroy your souls, which are precious in the sight of the Father. Verses 28 to 31. And then 32 and 33, he says, don't be afraid of being wrong. You ever have that feeling sometimes? Man, all of this, I'm all in for Christianity. My whole life is devoted to this. I've even made sacrifices, you know. But what if I'm wrong? What if I get to the end of my life and I find out, you know, ha, 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 it was a joke. You, know, you could have done this, you could have done that. You, should, you didn't have to feel good about this. You didn't have to control yourself. You could have just let yourself go and just have a great old time. You, Christianity is wrong, it's fake. Opiate to the masses. So Jesus says, don't, don't be afraid that you are wrong. Those who confess Christ they're on God's side. And those who deny Christ, they're the ones who are against Christ. Don't be afraid that you're wrong. You're right. You're on the right side. You're on the right path. Okay, so those are the instructions on how they should respond to the people you know, when they're rejected and so on and so forth. Don't be surprised and don't be afraid. And then he finishes up with you know, giving a comment on the reasons for the negative response to the gospel. He says, they're going to reject you, and let me tell you why they're going to reject you. He says, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword, for I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his um, of his household. 
He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it, and he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. And so the reasons for the negative response? First of all, the gospel brings division, not unity. You know, the gospel brings peace between God and man and it promotes peace among the brethren, but it creates a natural dividing line between those who accept it and those who reject it. I'll read that in a second. Secondly, he says, the gospel demands the highest loyalty, a loyalty that puts Christ above the closest of physical relationships even above the preservation of self, if need be. So Jesus is explaining that the negative response that they're going to encounter shouldn't surprise or frighten them because it's natural. The, the, the gospel is exclusive and it demands total commitment from those that it calls. It is this exclusive nature of the message that creates the division among nations and families and even individuals who have to wrestle with the question, will I abandon everything, including self, to follow Jesus? Hey, people were martyred. You know, uh, other people you know, were angry with Christians in the first century, not because they were moral, not because they rescued abandoned babies, which was the practice in the day. If you, did, if you had a baby you didn't want, you just left them out in the field. Not because Christians and the early Christians rescued these children, which was un, unheard of. Not because they refused to participate in the sexual perversions of the pagan religions of the time. They weren't hated because of that. They were hated because they said, there's only one God and there's only one way to be with God through Jesus Christ and all the other gods are just, they're nothing. They're nothing, they're just wood and stone, that's all they are. They have no life, they have no power, they cannot save you, they cannot give you anything and you are doomed if, if those are your gods, <laughs> good luck with that. That's why they were hated. They had the unmitigated gall to say there's only one God, only one way to be saved. People didn't like that back in the first century. And you know what? People still don't like that in the 21st century. They still don't like that idea. I've told you the story once when I, we were visiting people and we were talking about religion, they were friends of our children and you know, we had coffee with them and, and oh, you're a minister, ah, yes, you know, and then so of course all the questions, which church and blah, blah, blah. And, and then he asked me, you know, he thought, oh, I'll, you know, I'll get this guy, I'll show this minister. I'll say, so what do you think? You think all the Hindus are going to hell? And I said, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow, I mean, you know, the way he asked me the question, he deserved the answer I gave him. Yeah, it's unfortunate, but yes. Well, why do you say that? Well, in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, it says there's only one name under heaven by which we can be saved. Seems to me that excludes everybody else. Now, to soften the blow, I said to him, you don't have to believe that. I'm not going to grab you and twist your arm. To, you don't have to believe that. All I'm telling you is, if you believe the Bible, then that's what the Bible says about salvation, that there's only one way to be with God. There's only one God, and there's only one way to be with Him, period. So yes, if Hindus continue to believe what they believe, and if uh, Buddhists continue to believe what they believe, then yes, they're lost. Unfortunate, absolutely. Horrendous, of course. We're talking about incredible numbers of people. And they ask, how, would, how could God do such a thing? And I said, well, ask Him. Don't ask me. I haven't been given the job to do the judging. The only job I've been given is to do the proclaiming. 
and you're free to believe or not to believe. You know, we never did have coffee after that. It just it, it didn't, it didn't work, you know what I'm saying? It didn't work. But I just say that to underscore the idea that that message, that exclusivity idea about Christianity still rankles and still stirs hatred today. And the temptation is to soften the blow, to figure a way to compromise or change the gospel so that it will allow other people to go to heaven without believing in Jesus. Sorry. You can have a religion that says that, but you can't base it on this book. That's, that's the problem. And so Jesus says this, you know, this, is the, this is the problem. And then the second thing uh, that we'll finish up with is the um, uh, promise to those who respond, and that's in here. He says, he who receives you receives me, he who receives me receives him who sent me, he who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward, and he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever in the name of a disciple gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water to drink, truly, I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. So the first thing he says, you know, the gospel demands loyalty and, in its, and it's exclusive. And then he says, here's the promise to those who respond. The promise of a reward not only to those who receive the message from the mouth of the apostles, but also who in turn pass along to other that message. That's why he says a prophet, he receives the message from a prophet or he receives the message like a prophet gave it to another prophet and then he receives the message. He's talking about the long line of prophets and speakers and proclaimers throughout the history who are passing along the message from one generation to another. He said they're all blessed, the whole, even if it's 16 generations down and you've received the message, then you're, you're still going to be blessed because you've received the message. You, in other words, you didn't receive it from the Son of God standing right in front of you like the apostles did. You've received it from a you know, hundred generations of prophets and teachers and preachers and so on and so forth. It, the message is still good. The message will still reward you. And anything you do in the name of Christ counts. Even a glass of cold water given counts. Counts in one way. Counts as pleasing to God. Now it doesn't mean the only thing we do is give out cold water. <laughs> He's saying anything we do in the name of Jesus for someone else, even just giving a drink of water, counts with God more than building a, an entire hospital in the name of Joe Smith. Okay. And so the point he's getting at, of course, is Christ is the dividing line, always the dividing line between mother and daughter, father and son, husband and wife, best friends, whatever. He's the dividing line. And we have to accept that idea that in our own lives from time to time, that's the way it's going to be. And it's not easy. It's not easy. OK, so I did say, I put in another slide here, I think, that said, all right, next week, Let's go on to narrative number three, Matthew 11, 1 to 12, 50. It'll be two chapters. Okay, that's it for tonight. Thank you very much.